Welcome again. Today we look at the structure of the cell membrane and how that structure is related to the role of the membrane in regulating the movement of substances into and out of the cell. Behind me is a diagram to represent the Singer-Nicholson model of the cell membrane, also known as the fluid mosaic model of the cell membrane. Today we look at each of the components of the cell membrane and examine how they function in regulating the entry and exit of substances and we also look at some of the other functions that these molecules might play in maintaining the stability of the cell, regulating the fluidity and in facilitating things like cell-to-cell -cell communication. But before we examine the Singer-Nicholson model or the fluid mosaic model, it is useful to go back and look at where did this model of the cell membrane come from. Back in the times of simple light microscope, the cell membrane appeared as a simple line for the resolution of the light microscope is quite limited. Yet despite the limitations of the light microscope, Gorter and Grendel in 1925 performed a very interesting investigation using erythrocytes, red blood cells. They worked out the surface area of a red blood cell and then they removed the membrane of those red blood cells. The data they obtained showed that the surface area of the phospholipids that came out of the cell membrane was equal to twice the surface area of the red blood cell. This led them to the conclusion that the cell membrane must be made up of a bilayer, a lipid bilayer. And so the idea of the phospholipid bilayer was born with the membrane of the cell being made up of two sheets of phospholipids, each with their hydrophilic head and their hydrophobic tails. Soon after the work of Gorter and Grendel came the work of Davison and Danielli, and they examined the surface tension of the cell membrane and they examined the permeability of the cell membrane and they postulated the idea that based on the nature of the cell membrane surface, its surface tension and the kinds of substances that were allowed to enter or not allowed to enter the cell and they proposed that the cell membrane was not just a phospholipid bilayer but a sandwich type model with the phospholipid bilayer sandwiched between two layers of protein and at that time there was no evidence to refute such a model in fact in the 1950s with advances in electron microscope technology the evidence to support this sandwich model from Davison Danielli became even stronger with electron micrographs showing the classic railroad track with two dark lines on the outside to represent the proteins and two lighter lines on the inside. So the Davison Danielli model of the cell membrane remained for some time with its birth in 1935 way up into the 1960s. And then with advances in microscopic techniques and the quality of electron microscope images, Singer and Nicholson were able to propose the fluid mosaic model using evidence from freeze etching and advanced techniques like fluorescent antibody tagging today we realize that the cell membrane is not a sandwich model but it is made up of transmembrane protein putting a tag on the membrane proteins of a mouse cell and putting tags on the membrane proteins of human cells then fusing these cells together and observing whether the proteins remain distinct or whether they mix. The evidence demonstrated that red tags from mice and green tags from humans mixed evenly in time and this mixing was affected by temperature. The warmer the temperature, the faster the mixing. All of this lent support to the idea that the phospholipids lay in one plane and they have some mobility but the proteins are quite free to move in this fluid mosaic. And so the Singer-Nicholson model or the fluid mosaic model structure of the cell membrane came into existence and it shows that the cell membrane is a very complicated structure. Every cell has a slightly different makeup for its membrane and that this membrane structure also applies to the nuclear membrane and to other membrane bound organelles like mitochondria and chloroplasts and even the vesicles that move particles within cells and into and out of cells by endocytosis and exocytosis, these particles too are made up of this 
membrane structure. This symbol represents a phospholipid, a large molecule that has a phosphate head which is attracted to water on the outside and attracted to water on the inside. This is referred to as hydrophilic. And you have hydrocarbon tails which are referred to as hydrophobic. Then several proteins run through the membrane in some cases and partially through the membrane in other cases. Some of these proteins have channels. These proteins are associated with a range of functions including active and passive transport. A very important role is played by this structure here, cholesterol, which regulates the fluidity of the membrane, preventing it from becoming too solid or from becoming too liquid. In preventing it from becoming too liquid, it, re it reduces the mobility of these hydrocarbon tails. And in preventing it from becoming too solid, it prevents the tails from crystallizing. So the presence of cholesterol is very significant for it regulates the membrane fluidity and keeps it in the ideal state. Molecules like phospholipids are referred to as amphiphatic, having a hydrophobic portion and having a hydrophilic portion. On my diagram here, you'll also see that membranes contain glycoproteins. And as the name suggests, it's a mixture of carbohydrates and proteins. These glycoproteins perform a range of functions, including detection of neurotransmitters, hormones, and even in keeping the membrane stable as they help one cell to bind to another cell. Of course, the cell membrane is not simply a sac to enclose cytoplasm. It's much more than that. It's a very complicated structure which regulates the movement of particles into and out of the cell. One way in which this happens is by diffusion. Another way is osmosis. Then there is facilitated diffusion. And there is, of course, active transport. Diffusion is the spreading movement of a gas or a liquid from an area of its high concentration to an area of its low concentration across a concentration gradient. Diffusion happens in places like the alveoli of our lungs when oxygen diffuses from the alveolar space into the cells of the alveolus and then into blood cells. This diffusion requires not simply the spreading movement of a gas from one space to another, but these gas molecules must traverse the cell membrane. And the fact that oxygen is a non-polar molecule and a fairly small molecule makes it easy for oxygen to diffuse through the hydrophobic areas of the membrane, and so too for carbon dioxide to move from its area of high concentration in the blood into an area of lower concentration across the cell membrane. Osmosis is a special kind of diffusion involving the movement of the solvent, which, in, which inevitably in a cell is water, and here you can see a hypotonic solution or a weak solution or a dilute solution on the outside of a cell and a hypertonic solution or a strong solution on the inside. So what you have here is another type of concentration gradient, one that applies to, the, to a high amount of water molecules on the outside, a weak solution, a dilute solution, a hypotonic solution, and then a stronger solution in here in terms of the solute but in terms of the amount of water, a relatively low amount of water. So in time, because the solute is not able to go through these spaces, solvent molecules diffuse through these spaces. Also regulating osmosis is the fact that water molecules tend to bind and form bonds with solute molecules. So in areas like this, in addition to the fact that the water molecule is in a lower amount, but all of these solutes to bind to them, it even lowers the mobility and the equilibrium shifts from this area to this much faster. In other words, water molecules are even more likely to diffuse because of the fact that solute binds to the solvent by hydrogen bonding, with the water molecule having a polar nature and binding to solute particles further restricting their mobility. In addition to passing through the membrane of the cell because water molecules are small enough, 
albeit that they're polar, they are small enough to pass through the hydrophobic parts of the membrane. But there are special channel proteins called acroporins, where water molecules can go through a single file. And then we have facilitated diffusion and active transport. We want to discuss both of these in relation to the transmission of a nerve impulse. But to keep our neurons and axons at rest, a lot of work is carried out. The resting potential of an axon is maintained by a process of active transport. A negative charge is kept on the inside of the axon, and the positive charge is kept on the outside. But to maintain this state, it requires the cell to continuously expend energy in the form of ATP to force three sodium ions out of the cell. This forcing happens in association with a membrane protein and using the energy-rich molecule ATP, adenosine triphosphate. So as three sodium ions enter into a special protein in the membrane, ATP is hydrolyzed to ADP and the protein structure changes and pushes out three sodium ions. These three sodium ions move against a concentration gradient, moving from an area of their high concentration to an area of their low concentration. Moving from an area of their low concentration to an area of higher concentration, building up a high amount of sodium on the outside. And once sodium ions are delivered by the pump protein and the protein opens to the outside, then potassium ions enter and they are able to move into the cell and then ATP is reformed. In this way, potassium ions also move against a concentration gradient, moving from an area of low concentration on the outside to an area of higher concentration on the inside, building up very high concentrations. And in this way, cells maintain their resting potential, which creates a negative charge on the inside and positive charge on the outside. Another area where active transport occurs is in the root here of plants. These pots symbolize a range of transmembrane proteins, all there to pump ions in from the soil against their concentration gradient, to pull ions like magnesium, against their concentration gradient and to build up a fairly high concentration or a hypertonic solution inside of the root cells. What this does is it maintains a very high solute concentration which creates an osmotic gradient allowing water to move in by osmosis and also providing mineral ions for the cell which forms a part of the solution to get transported into the xylem. But the significant thing about active transport is that it requires energy and ATP is used in the process of active transport. Another example of diffusion is here in the dicot leaf as carbon dioxide diffuses through the stomata and it's able to fill up the air spaces inside of the leaf and then diffuse across the cell membrane into the spongy mesophyll cell. But after a nerve impulse is transmitted here in active transport, the nerve cell also provides us with an example of facilitated diffusion. Take for example this here, which represents the membrane of the axon. There are these voltage gates which open upon the propagation of a nerve impulse. And when these voltage gates open, Potassium ions are able to pass through passively because recalling that a high concentration was being built up in the resting state, potassium ions quickly diffuse out through special channels to facilitate their diffusion. No energy is required in this process and ions are moving from an area of their high concentration to an area of their low concentration. This diffusion happens in the absence of energy and some potassium ions flow out but once some of those potassium ions flow out, the gate closes. Finally, our discussion of transport across the membrane would not be complete until we consider the movement in vesicles. This movement can happen inside of the cell from one organelle to another. It can happen as substances exit the cell, leaving from the inside to the outside, exocytosis, or it can happen as substances move from other places into the cell, 
by endocytosis. A simple example to show endocytosis is feeding in the microorganism amoeba. Here you can see amoeba extending its false feet or pseudopodia around a food globule, allowing these two ends of the membrane to connect and to trap this food particle in a vesicle. This is an example of taking in or endocytosis, where because of the fluid nature of the membrane, it's easy for some kind of concavity to be established in the membrane and for the two ends of the membrane to coalesce and join to form a tiny food vacuole in the case of amoeba or a vesicle here in the case of a cell that might be taking in hormones or antibodies. Cells also manufacture a range of substances that have to leave one cell and move into the bloodstream. And these tiny vesicles break off from structures like the Golgi apparatus and move toward the cell membrane where the membrane of the vesicle joins with the cell membrane and the contents of that vesicle are released. This is exocytosis. Paramecium also provides an example of exocytosis as it gets rid of waste in contractile vacuoles. A very interesting way to track exocytosis is to provide cells with radioactive amino acids. And the radioactivity of the amino acid shows up in this area, followed by movement of the radioactivity off of this area into the Golgi apparatus, and then tracing that radioactivity into vesicles as proteins made from the radioactive amino acids make their way out to the cell membrane to exit the cell, transported in the blood to other parts of the organism. Important point to note about this is that it requires ATP. And as for intracellular transport by vesicles, sometimes vesicles move things within the cell without making these things leave the cell. So that would be an example of within the cell or intracellular. And all of this type of movement does require some energy in the form of ATP.